I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight into this exciting, unique workshop. Um, it's time to think pink. We spend so much of our clinical time thinking about white, thinking about beta shades, but we don't spend the time thinking about the pink replacement, the pink aesthetic. So tonight, uh, it's your journey. It's the start of your journey tonight. And I will just show you a little bit about what we're doing. I'll show you before and after, and then I'll uh, have type on models here. And as a result of this workshop tonight, you will improve your journey into pink aesthetics. And it won't take long. I have good news. I'll try to keep this as simple as I can. So you could actually do your techniques only using a different color of pink. The model that I created tonight is a special type of dot model. This is part one about gingival recession. We'll be working on two teeth. Number six will be a um, pink composite for gingival recession but using white techniques like you would do in a class five. Then if I take that model off and then put uh, the, uh, the objective, you can see we're gonna be working on six and seven. Seven will be my way with two layers. Your way will be with one layer and it will make it interesting and number seven, which will be my way, has two layers with sulcus development. It's going to be exciting. I want to acknowledge Catapult for Lou Graham, a person I have a tremendous amount of respect for, for his continuing education and forward thinking into the future of dentistry. I'd like to thank Shofu, who has spent a lot of resource and time developing the pink composites. We both shared that passion for years, and now we're bringing it to you. Tonight, we're gonna to talk about the trilogy of pink, which is gingival recession, dark triangles, and sulcus development. That could be a test question, so you remember those three things. What is the future of dentistry? It's not only white composites, but it's pink composites because gingival recession is one of the most common oral health conditions found in our patients today. This is due to a lot of factors, chronic inflammation, periodontal disease, periodontal treatment, occlusal trauma, and an aging population, as I've stated in the webinar. People are retaining their teeth longer, and hence we're gonna see a lot more gingival recession. All clinicians will have to know how to address and treat these um, defects uh, properly with pink composite. Think about this, the 80-year-old generation uh, will triple by the year 2060, so there's going to be ample uh, gingival recessions to treat in the future. Um, do you see gingival recession in your practice? The answer is yes. How do you treat it? Are you doing connective tissue grafting? which is the optimal, optimal biological aesthetic treatment option. Not everybody can afford that. Not everybody wants it. What if the patient doesn't want connective tissue grafting? What if they don't want the discomfort, the cost, the healing time? What are the other options? Well, it comes down to you with pink uh, aesthetics. So what we wanna do tonight is explore these possibilities what is pink aesthetics today? It's the illusion of gingiva where it doesn't exist. Pink prosthetics is an illusion. It's a simulation. It's a non-surgical cost-effective alternative to connective tissue grafting. What are the benefits of pink? Everybody wants to know what the benefit is. It's not a procedure. It's a benefit. What are the benefits? It's a practical aesthetical functional alternative to surgery. It's done in a single visit. It's not a new procedure, it's a new color. And that's very calming to us thinking that pink prosthetics is gonna be very complicated and hard to do. If you're doing white class fives, keep that technique. We're just introducing a different color. I'll teach you tonight so you can start doing these tomorrow in your practice. They're exciting. Well, you can use your technique 
We're just going to change the color. I'll show you how to do it. I'm trying to make the hard look easy and give you tips and tricks that I have learned on the foundations of pink aesthetics. And now it's your journey. Tonight will be um, a breakthrough uh, for your practice, for your neighbors, for your patients, for your staff. It's an exciting time. We want to make it look natural and not unnatural. And I'll take you through different criteria and how to start your journey in a large logical sequential way. You can use a single shade and just use your white techniques. You can do two shades. I'll take you through the shade mixing guide. And thank you, Shofu, for bringing us the, the, the mixing pad here, the mixing chart, and they've gone through a lot of detailing. There's five different shades, and then you can mix and match. You can make different colors uh, to customize the shades. So what I like about this, this mixing chart right here, they're custom colors, they're very accurate. We all know a lot about A1, A2, A3. What about pink? This is this mixing chart is actually a pink shade guide. So you can see you can um, mix in one-to-one -one ratios and come up with intermediate custom colors. And if we look at what Shofu did here, they came up with the mixing colors here just to show you how it works, is you could take an orange and mix it with a dark pink, and then you get your intermediate custom shade right here. These are repairable. You can, uh, the pink composites are repairable, they're adjustable. Um, they're replicas of gum tissue that aren't really the color of the gingiva, they're illusions. So they're very accurate. You can actually take the shade guide, the mixing shade guide and hold it up next to a patient's gingiva and pick the color. So what we want to do is we want this chart to use for precise shade matching, especially when you're into multiple restorations that are blended and you have uh, two layers of composite. So thank you, Shofu, for bringing us the uh, mixing chart right here. Um, tonight, we're going to say you can either use pink flowable uh, liner or not. Um, you can um, do a good service to your patients by bringing them pink aesthetics, and uh, you'll get a lot of referrals, and you are probably one of the only dentists that are going to be doing that in your, in your area. So what I want to do is tell you about the tips and tricks for pink composite. Let's go over the foundations, because once we start the hands-on, I can't review this again. The, the foundations and the tips and tricks are going to be preparation design. I've designed the bird kit for you. I'll go over that. Shade selection. I'll tell you how to blend shades tonight. How do we come up with a custom shade to match the type of Don Pink? We're going to go over placement, adhesion, finishing, and polishing tonight. That's a lot of things to do. Now, why are we using Beautiful 2 Gingiva? It's special to me because it's in a small space. It's next to the tissue. We don't want any biological in, impingement on the tissue causing inflammation, irritation. Not all these pink composites are created equal. I'll tell you some benefits that I like about the gymers from Shofu right now is that they promote health. They're clinically proven to be bioactive and therapeutic. What I like about it is antibacterial. It reduces the uh, plaque and biofilm formation. It releases and recharges uh, fluoride. You have five blendable shades. You have the therapeutic benefits for life of ionic exchange, and it leaves the tooth stronger than the original surface when you put a gymer, especially when you're um, in the, the uh, gingival recession area. Now, the step card. Let's say 
you all should have the step card. I'm not going to go into detail, but this is your how-to manual here. And it, Shofu and myself have done a, a, a great job, comprehensive, to include the course materials, the pink composites, the shade guide, the bird kit, the instruments, the beauty bond dental uh, adhesive, the one gloss, one gloss um, uh, finish polishers, the typodont, the mixing chart, the shade selection. We're going to make a custom shade tonight. And then we're going to go over the preparation. I'm going to show you how to outline the curved part of the anatomical crown. And then I'll show you how to have a scalper to establish the uh, initial uh, shape of the, the uh, pink preparation and then do the um, undercutting, slight undercutting, making it more retentive because we don't bevel pink prosthetics. This is going to be exciting. I'll show you how to do the very intricate dentin bonding so we don't get irritation and debris in the sulcus or any of the tissues. We'll show you how to do that. And then the application of pink composite is I will show you how to put a pink flowable base to add, uh, reduce the polymerization uh, shrinkage and stress in the preparation. Is my technique is how to handle and transfer increments of pink composite into the preparation, how to do that. I've come up with a marginating explorer and how to use it properly so there's no flash or irritation and debris into the pink preparations and restorations. Also, I'll tell you how to create a virtual sulcus with an IPC carver, finishing and polishing, creating the burr kit, a dedicated, very fine yellow marginating diamond that I'll show you how to use very efficiently without damaging the tissues, causing any irritations, and how to polish. As a bonus tonight, when we get into number seven, I will show you how to create micro texture before you light cure it, and then I will show you how, how to create even more micro texture after you light cure it. So there's a lot of good things, a lot of good information on how we do this today. So before we start our journey into pink prosthetics, let's go over the ground rules. I will tell you this, if you've taken my hands-on courses, I'm very meticulous about hand speed, hand motion, and saving time being more profitable. When you do pink, you have to be very, very deliberate. It's not a fast restoration. It's an efficient restoration that if you do it properly, you'll, there'll be less stress, more enjoyment, and your patients will love it as well. But if you watch my hands tonight, they're gonna go real slow because I wanna be efficient and finish in a timely manner and be profitable. What are the criteria? What are the right tools? You have to have the right tools that you purchased or can purchase to do pink aesthetics. You have to have a pencil to scribe the curvature of the anatomical, anatomical crown. They're not straight lines. The, the line, the pencil line will tell you where is pink and where is white. The, the pencil line is the border of pink and white. You have to know what side of the border you're on. I created a scout burr to uh, create the general outline of the preparation, not touching the pencil line. Then with a little bit of retentive preparation with an inverted cone burr, then we can get more retentive. We don't bevel the white margins on a pink um, composite. Selective etching, of course, when you do this, if you're on any enamel, you selective etch. Careful, meticulous placement of bonding agent is essential in pink aesthetics. The base layer of pink flowable helps manage the shrinkage and improve adaptation. We're going to do that on number seven. 
we will show you the pink mixing chart. We'll show you one and two layers tonight. One layer is fine. There's no problem with one. You could be done with one layer, no flowable, and you've done a great service to your patients. I'll show you the ball burnisher technique to transfer the material, the marginator instrument laterally to avoid any irritation, um, flash, anything like that. And with the, the burr kit I designed, the marginator burr to really bio-integrate the material into the preparation and keep away from the uh, actual gingival tissues. It, it is amazing what you can do. Then the polishing technique is very, very dedicated, very unique into a small space. So when you look at that, these are the criteria now that I've given you the tutorial. Hopefully you have your all your materials in front of you organized. And so this is where we're gonna start. So now we're gonna do number six. So what I will do now is I'll place the model. And what you're gonna see me do every time I move the typodont or hand motion, what I have to do is go back to autofocus. So you're gonna see me do this all the time. So this is the model here, back to autofocus. I'm gonna take the pencil and scribe, and you follow me now. Take a pencil, always have a good hand rest. And what we're gonna do is actually scribe the pencil line in a curved way. Right there. The anatomical crown is not straight. This is an illusion of the, the gingival part, which is pink to the anatomical crown. So that is first. Then we're going to start our preparation. But when you do the white replacement your way, you're using white every day in your practice. I'm, I'm suggesting you use a different color instead of white, use pink. You do it your way. You can do these tomorrow with your technique. You have the right tools for the job. You have everything. Uh, everything is ready to go. You can place one layer here and stop. You don't have to have a flowable base. You can do it without flowable. You can do it without a sulcus. Everything is set up for your success in your journey into pink aesthetics. You're doing a great service to your patients when you do this. And so let's start out, I drew a line. Now let's start out with custom shades. So if we take, I set this uh, workshop up for one half orange, one half dark pink. So if we, show how we transfer materials with a ball burnisher. This is how we're gonna put material into the preparation here. But first of all, let me show you how to mix. What I'm gonna do on a mixing pad is take one half orange, and we're going to do the same thing for number seven. This is dark pink. This is orange. 50-50. Now, this is volume estimation. I'll say this once. If you take too much material and place it in the preparation, now you have to take material out of the preparation which creates voids, which creates a lot of extra work. So we want to estimate the volume. So if I take that and now I take it with a ball burnisher and then I squish it with my fingers, estimating the volume that I'll need on the tooth and put it back into a, a sphere. You can place spheres, you can 
spread spheres. You can't take your IPC carver and cut all this, and then you'll create voids and it'll be a real mess. Then we can place the estimated color right on the typodont and see if it's a good fit. You can see right there, it's a simulation. It's a good illusion. So I am estimating this is going to be the volume of material for one layer. So now what I'm going to do is take that off, put that back on the mixing pad. I've scribed my line. Now I'm going to take the scout burr. And if you look at your, your burr kit right now, from left to right, you have a marginating burr. You have two inverted cone burrs, a small and large. You have two scout burrs on the right, a small and large. These are pear-shaped. And I designed this kit to help your journey into preparation guidelines. So the smaller the gingival recession area, the smaller the under the inverted cone and the scout burr. So in this exercise tonight, I'm going to take the small scout burr, which is the pear-shaped burr, and put it in the handpiece. Now, here's another tip. We use this all night. When you do this, don't handcuff yourself and put the burr all the way in to the hub. You've just short-shanked yourself because you're going to need all the room and visualization that you need. So what I recommend is take the burr out. When it first locks a little bit, that's where you want it. Look how long the shank is here. We want the shank extended so we have visualization. Now, what I'm going to do is use the high speed, and I have an, you have air syringes in your office. I'll have to use canned air. So now let's watch my hands. I'll try to autofocus. Same technique for number seven. Circular motion. How deep do you go? You're deep enough to place your dent and bonding adhesive. And if you're placing one layer, you don't have to go very deep. Notice I don't touch my pencil line. Try to maintain, maintain the curvature. See how slow my hands are working? Of course, you're going to use water spray. You'll be doing this with me. And that's about it for the scout bird. The reason I don't go right in, you can't use a 556, 557, because that's kind of a tough way to do it. This way, you got a little bit of retention in there already. And notice I didn't touch my line. Now, I'll, I'll put back the small scout burr, and now I'm going to take the small retentive burr, which is a small inverted cone, and now I'm going to go up to the pencil line and maintain the curvature. Follow with me. We've already established the boundaries. Now we're just putting a little bit of retention into the preparation following the curvature of the tooth. Especially on the upper lip, I imagine a lot of you didn't do gold foils, I did, and this is a gold foil preparation. Now, the preparation is done. If I want, 
I can take a moist gauze and get the pencil line pencil line off. Then I can blow air on it. You can use sodium hypochlorite. You can use disinfection. Now this is your first preparation right here. This is your first class five gingival recession pink preparation with a little bit of retention in it following the anatomical part of the crown. The next part is going to be adhesion. So when you do adhesion in pink prosthetics, you have two, play, two choices for adhesion, a bend a brush, which I call a mop, and a micro brush, which is the dedicated, very detailed way to place adhesion. So what I'm going to do is place the micro brush into the beauty bond, not to drench it, but just to keep the bend a brush moist. Now, when you do this, this is very important watch how I work my hands, is that you need at least 15 seconds to do the uh, at dent and bonding uh, placement, and you have to kind of scrub it in a little bit. It's a slightly acidic monomer, and when you do 15 seconds of, of massaging in here, then you get to a neutral pH, and that's where you get resin tag formation. Now, what do we do after the, the micro brush? What I do after the micro brush is that I will air thin a little bit. You take your air syringe, air thin. Now, before you lay cure, I take a bend a brush and I actually swipe the sulcus and get rid of any debris, any extra bonding agent that could touch the tissue. Now I know I'm ready for light curing. Do you see how meticulous that was with the dent and bonding placement? I can't tell you enough how important that is. If you just put that there and light cure it, you have debris into the tissue. Uh, you're going to get irritation. Now we have a 15-second light cure or 10-second light cure. You should be following with me. Now, we have our dent and bonding agent in. The volume of estimation, this is critical on your first attempt doing this, is that when you look at this, I am going to take the volume that I pre-selected that was blended with orange and pink and I'm going to take get my first glimpse at volume estimation. Now, when I put that in there, I take a look. I just don't beat it down and spread it and do like we do white class fives. This is curve. The this follows the contour of the root, which is convex. So if I thought I had too much material right there. I wouldn't place it, I would take it out, put it on the mixing pad, take your IPC and cut a little bit off, re-roll it with your fingers and put it back on. I think here, I'm gonna be pretty close, but I think I might have a little bit too much. So I'm going to retrieve it from the preparation, put it on the mixing pad, Take the IPC and take maybe 10% off. Now I'm going to take it back into the ball burnisher. I'm going to roll it in my hands, my gloves, and then I'm going to put it back in the preparation. And now it should just rest there. Right there. Here's the beauty of pink prosthetics or pink aesthetics that I developed the technique with a ball burnisher. It's already round. Now what you do is carefully tease it, carefully, very carefully touch it. When you do this, you see it's not getting away from you. 
What I'm doing here is pushing it, just tacking it lightly into the, the uh, uh, inferior part of the preparation. I'm pulling down just a little bit. I'm not beating on this because I don't want to do that. I'm just tacking it. And I'm kind of, I can go back a little bit, push it back in into the confines. I've got emergence uh, nesting right there so the tissue can be supported. I'm pulling down just a little bit. I can push it back here. You see, I don't have to do a lot of finishing and polishing when you just nudge this material. It handles great. There's no stickiness. You don't need to use bonding resin or uh, any bonding agents, what I tell you not to, or wetting resins. Now, when I have it, I have to make sure we're curved. So now what I'll do is I can take an IPC and maybe bring it down just a little bit into the curvature. I can bring it down into the curvature over here. Barely touch it so it's smooth. Shape it here, make sure it's curved. See how I can make that oval right there in here? Now, this is an interesting instrument. This is your marginating instrument. Now, we never use the instrument going this way. Gingerly, we drag it this way. So when you push it there, put it right there, very carefully, very carefully tease it, and now you have a joint that's fabricated already. I can't tell you how important this is. So if we take it here, very gently tease it, very gently, very gently tease it. Just a dragging stroke. Now you can go back if you say, gee, uh, Frank, I think I missed it. You can go back and nudge it again here. You can soften it right here. You can take your IPC. We don't want cleanup time. So you can just get all those little, little faults out of that and get it so it's almost ready to go and hardly any finishing and polishing. Once again, take your IPC, make sure you get your curve boundaries. You can kind of just stroke it this way, stroke it this way. You can finish with the marginating explorer. Very softly, just drag it, just drag it, boom. Up here, it's already tacked into the gingival part. You already nudged that with your, with your ball burnisher. Now, once again, reshape it just a little bit. Got a curved seam on it. How much finishing and polishing do I have to do? Not much. This is where you don't want finishing and polishing because it is a small space. So once you see that, once you see the outline, once you place the material, now I'm gonna cure it for 40 seconds. I hope you're following with me and watch how slow my hands are how efficient my hands are, how dedicated each stroke is to the final product. Pink is unique. It's not a race. It's how you can sequentially control your hand speed. Now, when you look at Right now, how much cleanup time do I have? The answer is not much. 
I will put back the inverted cone burr into the burr kit. The workstation is very organized. Now I'm gonna take the marginating burr, the diamond, and once again, we don't short shank ourselves and put it right tight to the hub. Never do that for operative dentistry or this kind of uh, dentistry, pink aesthetics, just so it grabs it and I can see, visualize everything I want. Now, when you do the margination, what I want you to remember is when we're up on the gingival layer, this goes up 45 degrees. And this, the tip is going to be touching the sulcus. Just the tip at 45. When you go to the lateral borders, what you're gonna do is just drag it, just drag it down. You never go back up. It's just drag it down and drag it down. Show you. 45 degrees. If you go flat, that's not gonna work. If you're over contoured, if you put too much bulk on, you can take it down with a diamond. You just created a lot more work. That's why volume estimation is so critical in pink prosthetics. So now I'm just gonna lightly take the diamond, very lightly, circumscribe a little bit with the arc. You need retraction cord in these. Uh, you don't have to, or put uh, articane into the papilla 4%. Now you can see what I've done. I've already finished and bio-integrated the cervical part. Now, what I do now is flatten the burr and drag, flatten and drag. Very light, flatten and drag. Now, this is not where I see dentists in classes, they do this rapid hand movement. You can't do that. It's very efficient, robotically controlled, dedicated like this. That's part one. Part two is with the marginating burr, go over the whole thing like a windshield wiper, making sure that the whole surface is contoured. We're looking for voids. If you're over contoured, you can take it down a little bit. I'm looking for seams. See how slow my hands are working. Look at the striations that I've created here on the marginating burr. The purpose of the marginating burr is to make sure everything is on grade. What do I mean? That means that everything touches the burr, the diamond, because you can't have voids, lack of integration, delamination, and expect to polish your way out of this, especially in the gingival complex, which is biological, physiological. It needs to have everything in harmony with the environment that you're working. So you can see, and don't be don't don't be too hard on yourself if you find that you have voids or low spots. Just remember, this is a typodon. When you get into the patient, do a few of these on your typodons. Now, what I see here is a restoration that has been primarily contoured and has no texture on it. Now, what I'm gonna do here is put the marginating burr back, and now I'm going to go into the one gloss. It's an amazing finisher and polisher. It doesn't leave any debris. 
And the same thing, when I do this, we go up 45 degrees around the gingival complex and then flatten it out. And we were in control at all times. We want half RPM, not high RPM, half RPM. Go through the gingival. Kind of a nautilus shell thing here. Go through the lateral borders. Lateral borders coming down. We don't go back up into the sulcus. Lateral borders. And then just kind of like a windshield washer, wiper, just go back and forth. Contour it a little bit. I suggest you do this dry so you can see. You can go into, into this cervical area where you have the curvature part of it. Just clean that up a little bit. And that's all it takes. This is your white class five, only we're using a different color. Now, I'll turn that off. And now what I'm gonna do is take a piece of gauze and let's wipe it, wipe it down and see what it looks like. A little, little air. This is a type of on. And if you look at right now, what I'm left with is a completely biointegrated gymer pink composite that the tissue can nest on and um, actually support the, the, the pink composite can support the tissue. So this is our first restoration. This was your way, a white technique using pink composite. I think you'll like that. And I think you'll find this fascinating. Take your time. What we have now to think about is the next part. You'll have a lot of questions. Now, the second part is going to be a pink technique with a little more sulcus development. It's one step further. It's a white replacement one step further with pink. The first layer of pink in a two-step part is the first one is color, the first layer. The second one is dimension and creating a sulcus with texture. I'm going to throw a couple bonus things in on you today, but I, I, I can't tell you how much I use pink in my practice. Periodontists refer patients to me um, when they can't uh, do connective tissue graphene or they're left with defects. They don't want to see a big, long, white uh, composite up on the root. Um, I use the pink composites for provisionals and crown and bridge. I use pink composites for implants on the base. The same things are true than before we have our mixed or blended shades. We have volume estimation, which is very important. And the, what we're going to do now is the same thing, is draw the curvature of the crown. This is our boundary. What is, what is pink and what is white? That we don't touch until the very end with a little bit of retentive uh, of the burr. So we already did the shade mixing. Now let's do the volume estimation. Once again, you're new at this and don't be too hard on yourself is that what we want is the mixture, but we're also going to have the first layer. The first layer will go into the superior part. And I will sh I'm just going to show you what I think the first layer volume is going to be. It's a small piece, a 
very small piece that's going to be that. And then we've got uh, pink flowable. So I'm going to take this off. This is confusing, guys. I know it's going to take you a lot of time. But even if you watch my hands on how to do this, I think you're going to learn a lot. What I'm going to do is switch over to the high speed and take my small scout burr. I've got the anatomical curvature of the tooth as my boundary. Just to get the, the primary shape of the preparation. Good hand rest. Little circular motions. Of course, you're using this with water spray on your patients. Doesn't have to go too deep. Curvature. That is the primary outline of the pink preparation with the scout bird. Notice you don't touch tissue. You don't get bleeding. You don't want any of that. So now I'm going to put the small scout burr back and I'll take the small retentive inverticone burr. Always clinically, intraorally, have a hand rest at all given times. So the, the hand is not free to do what it wants to do. It's locked in. Got to have a curvature on it. Just about done. Nice unified preparation following the anatomical curvature of the tooth. Again, don't make flat lines, they're fakes. They don't look real. Okay, this is the preparation. Same as number six. Now this is getting repetitive. So what we'll do now is take our gauze and clean it up a little bit. You can take sodium hypochlorite. You can do whatever you want. Now, here's, a, here's another tip. If you do get yourself where you have a little bit of pencil line on your preparation, what you can do is take your one gloss And just go over the pencil line here, just to make sure you don't want to, you don't want lead in your preparation like that. So you can get rid of it that way. That's a tip. We put this back. I always replace all the burrs that I go through, and they're all organized. Now I would air dry again. Air dry. Got our preparation, everything is good. Everything is ready. Now we go back into adhesion. So we take the micro brush. Once again, just enough liquid for the preparation. 
and we don't want to drench it, then we got to take some off. If you drench it and you have to take some off, then take a dry micro brush. If we put too much on, take a dry micro brush and soak up some of the bonding agent and get rid of that like this. Massage it for 15 seconds. Air thin. Now, before you light care, you can take the mop or bend a brush and just swipe around underneath the sulcus and clean it up. Ten seconds light care. Now, the, this is going to be pink flowable now. We're going to actually wet the base, more better adaptation. And when you put the cannula on the pink flowable, express a little bit out first. And this is not where you go heavy handed. You want to go very light touch because you do not want to get any debris or irritation or extra volume on that. You just do a little circular motion. Just a little circular motion. Watch it express. Just wet the box. Just like that. Now, another tip. If you don't, you don't want any air void, so you can take the Explorer tip and just massage it around. You don't want to get this outside the preparation. You just want to get everything unified like that. That is pink flowable. Do you need it? No, you don't have to. I like it. It's just an extra step to for adaptation and reduce the polymerization shrinkage stress. You can like hear that for 10, five, or 10 seconds. This is where it gets interesting now. The next volume is a very small volume that I've estimated. Let's say you have two layers and then you thought you're going to put something this big in there. A uh, major mistake because now you have all that extra to take out of there. So what I would do here is I volume estimated my first blended layer very carefully and placed it right into the preparation. The first layer is very specific. It, we're gonna hug it back into the border of white and pink and then taper it down triangularly and light cure it. The second layer goes right over the top. This is to establish color. The reason I did it this way with two different layers is that I think from a engineering perspective, this makes a lot of sense. Now I'm just tapping it down just a little bit. See how slow my hands work and I'm tapering it down and I triangulate it into the preparation. You can use both sides. Beat it down into the preparation. You can swipe it this way. This is the first layer. It triangulates down halfway into the preparation. Now when you light cure, this is already seamed up here. This is what it looks like. It's a very delicate layer. And I would light cure that for 10 seconds. Do you need that? No. You need a pink flowable? Not, not necessarily. I do because I want everything going my way for biological integration, adhesion, everything. That's number one. Volume two is the final volume of the curvilinature layer of the tooth with a sulcus. Okay. So I took 
the second layer, let's say I estimated, because now this is orange and dark pink. I'm sure some of you are behind me don't feel bad. Let's say I put that much material in there. If I say, how many of you think I have too much, every hand should go up. And if I try to beat that down and with a ball burnisher, I've got to subtract, take off, subtract, take off. I've wasted so much time doing that. So what I'm going to do is remove that, put it on the mixing pad. And what I'll do now, instead of using the IPC, I'll take my, my uh, marginating explorer and just subtract. 15%. When I do that, now it's still a tidy volume here. And now I'm going to put it back in my fingers and roll it and put it on the ball burnisher or transfer it gently. See how I just transfer that right there? Do you see how neat that is? All I have to do is estimate, is this the right amount of material, and then go for it. I think it is. So what I'm going to do is go for that, get my ball furniture, and let's, let's manipulate it and see how close I was. The first place is the most crucial, is touching the, just patting it down in the most inferior, ridiculous part of that, just tack it down, it's tacked. It's not pulling back. And now I just kind of drape it down a little bit, drape it, push it back up a little bit. Hardly any tension in my hands doing this. What I'm doing now is moving it into the first layer. And then I'm going to create a sulcus. Push it back a little bit so I can see my boundary. Got to make sure it curves. It's real important for pink aesthetics is a curved anatomical part. Push it back here, just tack it a little bit. Now I could transfer now to the IPC. I could even use the back part of the IPC like this and just tack it a little bit, just a little bit, just a little bit at a time. We don't want any dimples in here. We don't want any concavities, uh, delamination. It's already tacked into the sulcus. See how dedicated and how slow my hands work. Make sure it's curved. Push it back a little bit. Bring it down just a little bit now. Just work it out. Work it out, work it out. Slowly pull it down, slowly pull it down. Looking good. Now, with the marginating explorer, again, we pull down, we pull down. We can push it in a little bit, just a little bit, just tidy it up a little bit there, tidy it up a little bit here. It's tacked there. Get that little bit of debris out of there. Now, the final sulcus development will be with your IPC, or it could be your small ball burnisher. And just push it back up just a little bit. Push it, push it, shape it. Make sure you, you can pull it down just a little bit to get that nice little curve into it. Pull it down just a little bit. 
If you get a little bit of flush, just take your marginating explorer just a little bit here, just barely touch it, barely touch it. I can take the ball burnisher before I do this, nudge it up a little bit, tidy it up, make sure it's curved. Now, how much cleanup time do I have on this one? Hardly any. I did tell you I was gonna give you a bonus. Let's reflect on what we've done. Of course, I'm, I've done this. And I've struggled my first time. I had to figure this out. I didn't have a mentor. I didn't take a workshop. Nobody teaches it. It's amazing to me. That's why I explored this and was very curious. Why is nobody teaching pink? We're all teaching white. We want white. A1, A2, A3. Nobody's talking about prosthetic gingival shades. Nobody's doing that. So I said, I, ne I need to explore this. The literature, Christian Coachman. I have to work with a manufacturer such as um, Shofu, develop these shades, develop a step-by-step -step approach, a logical, and bring it to the bring it to the masses. And this is your journey now. This is pink prosthetics. Now I have to light cure it. Let's you're gonna light cure this and you're gonna say, well, how does Frank do this? Mine doesn't look like that. It it shouldn't. The more you do, the better you get. Now, as a bonus, what I'm going to do is take an Oral-B toothbrush, right, like that. See how those little heads are sticking straight out this way? I'm going to put micro texture before I light cure. Now, this is where you have to have a very steady hand block, and you can't beat on it because you're going to destroy it. So you barely touch it, touch it, touch it, touch it, touch it. Just barely touch it. Have an interesting little stroke. And what you're seeing here is you're diffusing the light. Now, instead of a reflective surface, surface you're getting a diffused sur surface. I think this is fascinating. Nobody taught me how to do this. I just figured this one out myself, how to put micro texture into that before you like cure it. Now, let's talk about what we just did. We did a repetitive service, a repetitive technique. Could have been your technique, your white technique, only we're changing colors on this. However, this got interesting. I talked to you about preparation outline, retentive preparation. There's no need for a bevel on this. This is a gold foil preparation. This is interlocked with a macro mechanical retention, but this is bio integrated with proper adhesion and the proper um, placement of very meticulous placement of the material, and so there's no um, bio-irritation. Volume estimation is crucial. You're going to go for this and say, oh, darn, I, uh, I can't do this. Uh, Milner showed me how mine's a mess. Well, mine was a mess, too. So the more you do on these typodonts and practice on the typodonts, the better you're going to get. Now, let's Let's take the curing light. And cure it. Now, think about this. You're generating heat right into the root of the tooth. So I would recommend that your dental assistant has an air syringe and blows air on this while you're light curing. 40 seconds. How much cleanup time? Not much. If you do not watch your hand speed, you watch your efficiency, you will create too much material. And now you got too much cleanup time and that there, there goes your profit. So this is a business. 
as well as dentistry. This is the business of pink aesthetics in a proper way to, to uh, be profitable. Now, if you look at the light reflection, look at number six. It's going to be totally reflective. Nothing wrong with that. A little bit of texture from the one gloss. Really like the one gloss. The points. You don't use discs and and uh, cups and things like that. You don't. I wouldn't do that. And now, see, it's reflective when I move it around. Now we're going to go to number seven and watch that light diffuse. It's diffused, and if you're really punctured the surface, you're going to get plaque in those. Not a good deal. So if you just a little bit of micro texture with an Oral-B toothbrush, that's good. Now, what do we do now? Oh, sure, you can take the one gloss, and we can dress that up a little bit. Frank said, uh, do a little micro texture. Some of you push too hard, and you got a little puncture marks and there's going to be plaque in there and everything. Let's do this. As a bonus, let's do something special. This is my technique. I developed it in the Burt kit. I'm going to take a Dura Greenstone from Shofu. Remember they had brownies and greenies when you're doing amalgams and all that stuff. So let's go into, put the green stone from Shofu. See that? That's a point. I'm going to go back and show you how you can put a little different micro texture in with the green stone. Now, once again, you don't go as high as you can. You're backing off maybe half RPM. So when you do this, are we going to really get into this and drop the RPMs because we're really raking on that surface? The answer is no. So what I'm going to be doing is a staccato type of movement. I'm going to be going simply. Now, what I just did was show you an alternative bonus way to put micro texture. You gotta remember this, you're an artist. You're simulating, you're, pl you're placing replicas in white, replicas in pink. And when you're doing a replica of gingival tissue, some of that tissue has micro texture in it. And if you put a shiny pink restoration, it's a mismatch. And there's nothing wrong with that. You did a good service. You did what best practices do. You did everything. You did the custom blending of the shades. But now we're going a step further. We're creating micro texture to create a simulation of nature. This is the Dura Greenstone from Shofu. Now, Talk some more. Now, if we go too heavy handed with the one gloss, you're going to wipe out your surface texture you just did. Now, when you take my uh, master's class with uh, uh, white composites and you say, Doc, uh, Frank, how do you put the surface texture? I want surface texture. Show me how to do it. And if you put surface texture and then you take a disc and wipe it out or a polishing cup point, um, a luminous oxide, anything like this, uh, three micron diamond polishing paste, you're just going to destroy everything you just did. And now you're in reverse and you're going backwards and the stress levels increase and the profitability decreases. Now, let's turn up. Not a high speed, one gloss, half speed. The first thing we do when we do polishing is put 
the one gloss up at 45 degrees and do a windshield wiper on the sulcus. Don't touch it too hard. You're going to wipe out that micro texture and then come down here, just pull it down, drag it down, drag it down. Nautilus shell strokes. Now, what you didn't see me do was the marginating burr. I didn't go back and do the marginating burr to make sure I had it. I had it. Now, if you have to do that, now you go back. You could have gone before you did anything, but see, I had to put the micro texture in before I light cured. And if I if I do that, then I take my marginating burr, I'm probably going to wipe out my micro texture. But I want you guys to verify with the marginating diamond that indeed you have touched everything. So what I have done here is definitively did a two-layer technique with curvilinear anatomical scribe lines on this, which is the hallmark of pink aesthetics. And then I did micro texture a couple different ways. Now what I'll do is take my wet gauze sponge. And when you put saliva on this, keep it wet. I have one more bonus for you too. When you have these wet, this is what saliva is going to do. They're going to glisten. Now I want you to just take a look and see what happens on the different six, which is reflective surface, and number seven, which is diffused. Okay, curved, convex. They're not flat. A root is not flat, it is convex. You are reproducing nature according to its characteristics. Now, I'm really satisfied with that. There's no open margins. Everything is bio-integrated. Thank you for the gymer chemistry, antibacterial, anti-plaque formation. It's built right for pink prosthetics. Now, as a bonus, you can stop right here. You didn't have to put a sulcus in. You didn't have to put two layers in. You could have put one layer in, done a heck of a job, and started your journey into pink prosthetics. But let's go one step further. Let's go back into the Denton bonding agent. What happens if you create a sulcus and the, the patient says, hey, doc, um, what's this ledge here? I feel a ledge, that's a sulcus, it's up a little higher. If you get them flat, there's no ledge, there's no sulcus. But now if you have this, I don't think patients like that too much. So what I'm gonna show you here is you take a little bit of Denton bonding agent and just wet this right here. You don't have to go back and acid that you could. Just air cure, air thin. You light cure. Five seconds, 10 seconds. Now, this is fun. I thought of this and I figured, what, what, what can we do? Well, now what I'm going to do is caulk the window with a flowable. And the thing I like about the uh, Shofu uh, flowables, they have gymers too, and they have some very interesting shades. They have <clears throat> no flow, uh, stackable, uh, more viscous, and they have different colors. One color I like is milky. It's really kind of cool. Now, what I'm going to do is caulk the window frame up here and then light cure it. 
This is where you don't want to get sloppy. What I want to do here is this little circular motion. Starting to come out. Excuse me. Little flow ball right here. Move it around in a circular motion here. And we want that flow ball to come up to grade so you don't feel the lip. Little bit right there, little bit right there. Now, take a dry bend a brush. Which way am I gonna go? Am I gonna pull down this way and bring all that into the crown? Or am I gonna pull back into the window with the cock, pull it back up here to angle it up? The answer is you're going gingerly. Go real light, nice light swipe, nice light swipe, nice light swipe. Now, the window's cocked. There's no lip. That's a flowable bead. So now what you do is after that, you like her. What happens if you put dent and bonding agent in, it wasn't retentive or you didn't have uh, good adhesion, uh, maybe you should have put some acid etch on that, like a selective etch technique. Dent and bonding agent, do you have to cure the dent and bonding agent at that minimal film thickness or um, minimum thickness? The answer is no. So now I've given you bonus techniques. Now, some people would say, Frank, do you put a sealant on here, uh, put a, a glaze on these with a uh, paint, a, a glazed layer on there? The answer is no. You don't want to do that because your technique should be good enough to start out with where you don't have to do that. So there are a lot of different things that I showed you. Some bonus tips. I showed you essentials. I showed you what the toolkit looks like, the toolbox. I showed you the burrs that I created, I, the different layers, the mixing charts. I threw a lot of stuff at you. Now, I'll show you behind the scenes what I do. And this is what I would do clinically when I do a um, a uh, pink class five, gingival recession. My assistant Sharon and I have been working together for 32 years, is that we see things together as a team. And so when I say, Sharon, we're gonna mix, uh, this is a straight on dark pink and she'll get some out and she looks at the volume too. And she dispenses the material out of the syringe in, in her estimation what volume is. If I say, Sharon, we're going to mix um, uh, half orange and half dark pink, and we're going to do, we're going to do a one or two layer technique. She's automatically putting increments together separately so we can mix mix them in the correct volume. Now you have four eyes looking at something versus two eyes. So if I showed you what I did for this exercise here today, this is what I did prior to all of you working together is that you did it the hard way and I did it the easy way is I did dark pink, two increments, one layer, two layers. I had all that laid out. So I knew the proper volume of material and my procedure went relatively efficient, effective and profitable. This is a lot of stuff here tonight that I want you to learn is don't get discouraged. It's real easy to get discouraged because you're not experienced. But if you have a guide, if you have a step chart, 
if you have a one, two, three recipe, a formula that is clinically proven by Shofu and myself, then I think you're on your way. I would encourage you to remove six and seven in your operatories at another time. Just take them out, drill them out, whether they get big or not. Maybe they got bigger and now you can use a larger scout burr. Now you can use a larger uh, retentive burr. Is I would do these over and over again on six and seven and see your progress. You're going to get better. You're going to get better tomorrow because you're using your technique, your white technique. You're just using a different color. It's simple. It's effective. And I think it's very satisfying to do something uh, artistically as well as applying the science to it. So this is how we do pink prosthetics. I'm a good time manager. I'm actually ahead of time. And I sh there should be a lot of questions on this. And I just want to kind of wrap it up. And um, let's just go over what we did. There's different kinds of cases of pink aesthetics. There's easy ones, like we just did this today. You can start doing these tomorrow. There's medium difficulty restorations. It'll take a little more practice. And then there's the more difficult ones. It'll even take more practice. I thought my intentions were very clear that I wanted this workshop to simplify and jumpstart your journey with a special tape it on into pink prosthetics. The pink toolbox is essential to start your journey. If you think you can do it without a toolbox, without a manual, without a, a type it on, I, uh, I'm, I'm all for it. You go ahead and do it. I think it it's such a unique restoration. It needs to be proven that you have the hand skills before you do that. If you make purple tissue instead of pink tissue, this is an unsuccessful restoration. If you do this and you wind up making the periodontal condition worse, it's not a successful restoration. What we want is the um, a blueprint for success. And this is what the Shofu manufacturers and myself are in very, our in true intention is to provide the recipe for success to do this. Now, if you notice on this type of aunt, there's actually two sides that I developed this. And I said the trilogy of pink is sulcus reproduction, dark triangles, and gingival recession. Well, if you look at that, that side, there's side two. And this happens in dentistry, and the periodontists are going to tell you it happens is they'll send them back to you and the patients are not happy. And obviously you can't destroy the tooth and do crowns on it and try to simulate white in there or try to put pink porcelain, you just destroyed the tooth. So part two of our journey in prosthetics, pink prosthetics, will be the dedication to black triangle closure with sulcus reproduction. I think this would be an amazing journey for us together in a workshop. I think it's fun, it's learning, 
I think there's development in your talents. And this is what I wish for you is that you've had a satisfying experience tonight into your journey with pink prosthetics. And I do believe that those who have attempted pink um, aesthetics will find this workshop uh, valuable where they can now use some of the tools, the tips and tricks that they can uh, actually go back tomorrow and do something more successfully. So once again, what did we what did we do today is that we started with this. We started our journey with gingival recession. And some of us would probably put white. They would put white down, meaning white resin composite into the gingival space and create a distraction, a long tooth. Or we do gums up. And this is where we have the pink, where it should be. This is where we started, and now we're a little more experienced. And then we took that to this. We did simulation. We did an illusion. We did... Uh, uh, something that is a replica, and this is not precise. You tell your patients, this is not perfect. This is not a, an exact duplication. This is a replica simulation that is an illusion. This is what we do as clinicians and artists. So... With that, I think we're closing early because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions to be answered. And the other thing is, please be um, mindful that if you want to purchase the uh, entire kit, that's the way I advocate. There'll be instructions from Catapult, Shofu, how you can purchase this. I think it's a good way to restock, especially in your operatories that is uh, uh, need extra inventory. It is all all restockable things like that. Why don't we go to some questions? Okay, um, I'll just we'll start going right down. Uh, are you using an electric cam piece? The answer is absolutely. Um, I can't work with an air turbine. Uh, you're talking to an aging, aging baby boomer that um, we had air turbines scream in our ears for decades until the electric pieces, hand pieces came out. And every time you use an air hand, uh, air, air turbine, you, as soon as you touch the surface, the uh, RPMs drop 50%. Um, with a, a electric hand piece, you can control the uh, RPMs, the torque on these. And I would say the answer is yes, because the tip, and out, tip about not pushing your burr in all the way, of course, won't work with a traditional air-driven hand piece. Well, very true. Um, we can adapt. We can find ways to improvise, but that's very um uh, uh, insightful, a very good question. Would you could please draw on paper the class five preparation and profile? Oh, that's cool. Okay, let's do one. Let's see if I can get some paper. Here, that's a great one. What I find fa I, what I find fascinating is that um, when I'm a I came from a different time of GB black gold foil preparations. I had to do it on my national boards. We did a gold foil. So let's say, let's say we have a tooth. And we go here down the lingual. And then 
we have gum tissue here, recession, and then we have a cervical embrasion. This, this is actually a great question, it's engineering. Let's say you have a cervical abfraction. This is really tough because if you think you're gonna get your, uh, restore your way out of that without putting some uh, uh, retention in your preparation, um, it's gonna come off. So what we do is when we do the preparation, you have to have your retentive, retentive uh, uh, gold foil preparation, and you have to have your interlocking. This whole thing is interlocked right here. The reason you don't bevel a, a pink composite is because it really looks weird. If you put a bevel on that, now you're losing the, the total effect of the pink and it gets diluted down. So this always gets undercut or more retentive this way. Now, all the C-forces, all the stress distribution in a natural tooth, the load comes in here on the incisal edge. It gets distributed down here to the DEG and that's where maximum stress occurs in the class five area. That's why you get enamel blow-offs from uh, clusal trauma and things like that. So if you don't do retentive class fives, if you were doing a white class five, I, I put a radius bevel all the way up in here. Now you have a shield of hydroxyapatite to hold this whole thing together. With pink class fives, you can't do that. So you better undercut those and um, be retentive. Otherwise, I just can't see how that's going to work. That's kind of an interesting question. Um, for mixing, which gloves should, are to be voided? Latex, I use nitriles. Now, another good question. Here's an opportunity for learning. Sharon is intuitive. We are seamless. And anytime I hold my gloves out to her, like this, she wipes them with alcohol, okay? And then I just wave my gloves in the air and they're dry. So I use nitriles, but uh, you can't have debris on your gloves for white or pink. And so you just hold them out and your assistant should have uh, alcohol gauze and wipe your fingertips. They, got, they have to be clean, especially when you're rolling and things like that. I hope I'm answering your questions. Do you ever uh, observe recession above the pink uh, with time? Sure. Well, it comes down to oral hygiene. You know this, that some of these epithelial gingival tissues are paper thin. And you have to be very careful with a toothbrush, um, with an electric toothbrush. You can traumatize it uh, and do that. But the good thing about when you nest a pink composite into the tissue that is convex and is bio-integrated, you're actually going to support the tissue from getting worse. So that's why um, pink um, prosthetics or pink aesthetics has a value. Um, here's a question. Um, what is the burst speed finishing? One, uh, okay, let's back up one quarter, one half, three quarters or full speed. When we're doing... Um, when we are doing uh, bio-integration with the uh, uh, marginating burr, you have to have, go by your light touch. You could rub that up to full speed, but you better not be touching it too hard because you're just engaging the tip in the sulcus and you're engaging the barrel on the face of the tooth. I'd say I'm probably about three quarters uh, full RPM kind of scares me. It's like a Maserati. You know, you don't know where that's going to go on you, especially if it bites and it, then you it, then you get a divot in your restoration. Um, here's another question. If you have the root surface exposed due to recession and you want to bond the pink composite to it, how well would it bond? Well, it will bond, not successfully, unless you prepare the tooth with retention. 
So the answer is yes, it will bond. Unfortunately, it won't bond for long. And you have to follow the sequence of the step cards, at least in my opinion, if you use my technique, I think you'll be much more uh, special. Uh, next question. When using the bender brush, how do how do we have to be worried about the curricular fluid uh, contamination on the prep area? Wonderful question. What you don't want to do is a, gr a brilliant question. Is that you can't be doing pink aesthetics on tissue that's going to bleed. Not good. You're shut down. You can't do it. It won't work. So you could put retraction cord in first. Triple O, retraction cord with hemodent, without. That's called sulcus expansion. Um, one of my tips is that I take with a microneedle with articane 4%, and I actually inject anesthetic into the papilla to cut the blood flow down. And um, if I think I'm going to get uh, gingival bleeding, um, that's what I do. I don't want to get shut down because once you bleed, once you get into your, your bonding sequence, you, you don't recover from that. It, it gets, you're in chaos and that doesn't uh, work. So that's a good question. Um, what curing light are you using? Well, I think the proper curing light is one that works. One that has a, a radiometer on it that's tested uh, frequently that has the uh, bandwidth uh, of the uh, photo initiators in there. There's so many good ones out there. I don't think I'm really going to tell you which one I uh, use. I think as long as they're tested on a regular basis, that's the one you want. Um, what if gingiva bleeds? How do you control it? Um, first of all, you avoid it. Not how you control it. How do you avoid it? And how do you avoid it is you have proper oral hygiene before the patient comes in. If the patient has gingivitis with bleeding, curricular fluid, uh, you, that's not a candidate for pink aesthetics. That's a patient for oral hygiene instructions until it gets better. Don't do it. Uh, you'll regret it because you're going to have to redo it. And that can go from bad to worse. So qualify your patients. Do you, here's another question. Uh, do you still prep even though there's an ab fraction or uh, abrasion lesion? The answer is absolutely. Because the ab fractions that are triangulated, those are the ones you got to really look out for because all that energy in the stress distribution uh, comes right into the class fives. And that's why there's an ab fraction because all that stress accumulates. Think about this. Stress goes through the incisal or occlusal uh, on a molar. It, the stress gets distributed, distributed into the DEJ, which is hypermineralized, and it goes laterally to the DEJ. Then what happens is this amazing thing. The stresses that go horizontally all of a sudden go vertical down the shaft of the tooth, and that's where the class fives are, and then it goes into the root like a piling. So you have to prep the ab fractions in my world. I live in with engineering forces, albeit uh, retentive, or if you're using white, you go into radius bevels and leverage the amount of ab fraction. If the ab fraction is a volume of one, then you have to have a radius of enamel two, two X on that one. Um, how would you create a zenith to the simulate the free gingival margin? Well, the zenith, well, if we're talking on the uh, the sulk or up in the the, uh, the most gingival part of that, you have to bio-integrate it and keep it convex. And one of the advanced techniques I teach um, later on um, is how to do an add-on, a freestanding sulcus after you do your two-layer uh, development without a sulcus. Then I'm going to show you how to freehand a, a virtual sulcus in there and then caulk it. So there's different techniques that I have. Um, 
Here's another good question. How long would you tell a patient if they said, how long do you expect these to last? Um, what success have you had in five to 10 years? Well, if you look at it, there's not five 10K studies on, on these things. This is a really, relatively new pioneer uh, uh, front into uh, dentistry. I can tell you this, if you do them right, like anything else, how long, if you do them right, I put a one-year warranty on my work. And if it chips or anything, they're repairable. Uh, you can rejuvenate these. If you uh, put the retentive preparations in there and do this right with adhesion placement and everything, uh, there's no reason why these are going to come out. They, it, it, it seems illogical to do that. So I would say at least what it happens if you don't do anything, how long is the tooth going to last? I'm more concerned about the survival rate of the tooth. Um, Here's a question. Did you prep the whole visible root surface or just apical to the pencil mark? Ah, the whole root surface. Because you have to nudge up to the inferior border where the, uh, the anatomical sulcus is. Just think you did a virtual piggyback sulcus on an anatomical sulcus. So you have to, yeah, you, 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 you touch it. You just nudge up to it because that's the technique is for full root coverage that is convex with a curved uh, margin. Um, is this done with or without water in the mouth? When you prep, you better believe it, you use water. Um, copious amounts, because you're in a very delicate, vulnerable area where the, the uh, pulp is underneath there, not too far away. So you, you, do want, you don't want to do any trauma to that. Um, any idea when the second series on Papilla, <laughs> Papilla generation might be done? I, I like the curious mind. Um, the curious mind has no boundaries, and I have no boundaries. And um, I'm already thinking of uh, other courses besides one. That's that's what I want is to create uh, armies of people that can do basic prosthetics and does it do a great service for the patients and um, is satisfying to you. And then uh, you just stay tuned to the manufacturer, Shofu or Catapult. And I think in 23, uh, if the stars align, we'll be doing another one on the other side of the Taipodon. Is there a reason why you don't use retraction cord? Well, yeah, you don't touch the tissue. And you don't need retraction cord. If you're not touching the tissue, it's not going to bleed. That's what you call um, a very good technique. And if you think you're going to get blood and any of that stuff and curricular fluid, by all means, put a triple O cord in there to start out with. Depends on how deep that defect is. Sometimes uh, it's really, uh, it's paper thin. It's like onion skin. And sometimes you can't even put retraction cord because there's nothing to retract. So you got to do something else on that. Okay. Um, I noticed that your pink composite is shaped like a white composite restoration. Is it possible to shape the pink gingiva to look more like natural when you're required to put white composite or just put it back in the coronal shape? then combining the pink to look more natural. Well, I'd like to see your technique and I'd like to see some of your uh, pre-op and post-op photos. The technique that I teach is I think a good recipe to start your, um, your journey. And I do think that with the proper um, um, preparation and uh, curved anatomical lines with the sulcus with texture i think that's in my world i think that's natural for me that for me that's success here's one are you offering a course that closes embrasures with pink composite um how does that compare to injection molding with the bioclear composite it's very interesting this is a buzzword in our our world of dentistry today 
And I am just for a disclosure, I am a uh, at the master master track level at BioClare, and I do injection molding. I do injection molding with thermal viscous composites that are heated to 155. I think is very valid in our profession, and there's a lot of liter literature on that. And not to tip my cards, but in other words, to have a dark triangle closure, if you're familiar with BioClear, then you have to do injection molding first to close it before you would overlay it with pink. Um, have you ever had a situation where the gum recessed past the pink restoration? Well, sure, I think we cover that. Um, if you have fragile tissue and the patient is either aggressive with the toothbrush or there's just no, no protection, yeah, you can get more, but remember, we're talking about the survival rate of the tooth versus the boundary of the pink composite. I'd rather uh, have recession around a little bit of the pink composite than to wind up losing a tooth. And um, uh, actually, you could call the pink composites or pink prosthetics um, uh, implant pre uh, preservation uh, uh, a, a service to that. So um, I think we covered a lot of questions and I'll be darned, we're 10 minutes early. Um, here's one, uh, here's another one. Uh, what is the bonding agent? The bonding agent is a universal seventh generation Denton bonding agent. Uh, you could do fifth generation. Uh, I don't think you wanna do fourth generation. I think a any successful bonding agent, it has a film thickness of uh, maybe three to five microns um, that you massage it in enough to get the, um, the acidic monomers into a neutral pH that you get resin tag formation. I think that's the one you want and you don't get sloppy with a uh, bonding agent. Um, that's the that's the world I live in. And here, well, there's a lot of good questions tonight. I'm really impressed. Um, any thoughts on the best way to remove biofilm? The answer is yes. And you can't bond onto biofilm. Um, you can't etch onto biofilm. You blast it. And either with an air abrasion unit, a micro air abrasion, I'm all for that. Um, I do that all universally in operative dentistry. You do that on your zirconia crowns. You mean you uh, air braid it, and before you put your uh, uh, Z prime on it or whatever. So yeah, I'm a I'm a fan of of air abrasion, but I'm not a fan of air abrasion that has a uh, that removes a lot of tooth structure, especially roots tooth structure is softer and it's gonna be removed quicker than uh, enamel. Uh, do you follow up photos uh, and post? Uh, I've got uh, pink composites on my website. Um, and do I, do I take photos for, for the articles? I published articles on pink composites in the literature. I was one of the first ones to do that. And um, I think the important thing is to look at the literature and look at especially Christian Coachman. Uh, he was the pioneer that I learned by studying his articles. Um, do you adjust the occlusion in a highly, highly occluded tooth? Oh yeah, oh yeah, you better because especially on an incisor like that, when you have all these lateral and tensile bending forces, that's just gonna go right to the class five area. So I would definitely do that, uh, adjust the occlusion. Um, what do you charge for these? Good question. Same as white composites? Well, um, I guess I have to be somewhat careful of what I say here. LD Panky said, uh, you get paid twice for your work. You get paid time for your service and you get paid time for your pride. And to start your journey, I, I'm not telling you what to do. Insurance drives a lot of practices and you have to be able to learn and give away some of it to be competent and go to the next level. So 
I would say on the simple, easy class fives, that recessions that are white replacements, I would tell you to start your, your charging the, the simple fee. You have to document these and um, insurance companies are looking at you. So you have a pre-op what it is. Now, if insurance does not cover gingival recession, um, then how do you submit that to insurance? Now you have to sign a disclosure to the patient that this is not an insured uh, restoration, and then you can charge what you think your 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 time is on this. Uh, I charge my time based on complexity, patient expectations. Am I doing a lot of micro texturing? Am I doing a lot of uh, custom shading things like that? Um, that's my journey, and you get to charge whatever your journey is at that point. Is there a code to put through this? Um, I, I, good question. Is it covered under your, your patient's insurance? Better be careful on this one because if you're doing uh, elective uh, gingival replacement and how do you, how do you uh, uh, answer to an insurance company when the, they don't cover it, uh, I would be very cautious and find out what uh, what they cover and what they don't. Do you put desensitizers before you bond? Yeah, you can. Um, uh, I use Microprime. Um, there's other things. I'm I'm not a huge Gluma fan. Uh, you could do that. Uh, but yeah, I always like to disinfect. Uh, my my mentor, Dr. Paul Belvedere, was always a fan of sodium hypochlorite in there, and I never questioned him about that. Um, the water was about finishing and polishing only. Um, you can, when you're lightly using a one gloss, you can do that dry. When you're getting into uh, a heavier um, contact on the surface, then I think you want to be careful. And then I, that's when we start putting water spray on that, like a fire hose because you don't want to heat up that surface. Um, that's something you have to be careful for. Um, there's a lot of different things to, to think about. Um, let's see, maybe I'll take one more. Uh, do you ever retract the tissue with an instrument? Oh, this is a good question. Um, the answer is yes. Uh, you remember uh, a clinician's choice had Zakira, which was a elliptical, almost like a round squeegee um, with a handle on it that you could retract the tissue with that. And that I, I think they still make them. That was a heck of a deal. Uh, you could really isolate that. Um, uh, yeah, but you, you have instruments that can retract the tissue, pull it down. And then when you are uh, using your um, uh, marginating burr, you don't uh, curatage on the tissue. Um, uh, is there a light on your loops problematic when formal photopolymerization? The answer is yeah. You got to have that because otherwise you're going to start curing material. And uh, that's that's not a good one. So um, I wish you all well, and I want to thank you for um, being with me tonight. And, and uh, you can always email me questions. There's a, a portal that will tell you how to get a hold of me. Thank you very much.